who don't know, um, is a lottery funded project and it's all about helping you guys get into the music and creative industry. Um, so we run masterclasses every month to help expose all the roles um, available within the industries, um, just to give you kind of better knowledge of what it's all about. Um, and today on our panel, um, which will be followed by a Q&A, um, we have the lovely Goldie Rocks. Now Goldie Rocks um, presents Capital Weekend uh, um, with Ministry of Sound every Friday and Saturday. Um, also the weekly selector show on Capital. Um, she's DJ for the likes of Madonna, um, Richard Branson, a real eclectic mix. <laughs> uh, we've, got, um, uh, we've got Ross Buchanan, um, and uh, Ross presents the uh, Radio X's 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. weekend show. Which sounds like a great slot. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, early hours. Um, we've got Phil Clifton. Um, Phil Clifton is also from Radio Rex and does week weekdays seven to ten. And then finally, we've got um, Jay London. Jay London's from uh, Capital Extra and does Monday to Thursday ten till uh, two a.m. And also um, is co-founder of his own business. So um, yeah, you can give that a nice little company. So thank you all for coming and uh, take it away. Nice. Hello, everyone. Hello. Is this? Yes, we're loud. We're on. Brilliant. Um, okay, so this is Presenting 101. Now, you can see we've got varied presenters from all our different stations on Global. So we're all going to have a very different perspective on what makes a good presenter, how you get into the industry. Uh, but hopefully you'll find that interesting. Um, key things we're going to talk about, how to make a good demo, what makes a good link, um, how to negotiate your role within the industry. So hopefully giving you some some solid advice here. Um, we'll then open it up for Q&A towards the end. And yeah, keep the questions coming. Feel relaxed. I want this to be quite informal and, and um, easy. So <laughs> easy. So um, this is for each of you individually. How did you become a presenter? Um, so I started off uh, at university. Um, well, I was I was kind of like a singer songwriter when I was like 18 years old, and I decided that I preferred talking in between, like playing the songs, than actually playing the songs. And um, I got interviewed by BBC Radio Two um, for this like documentary they were doing on up and coming. Uh, singer songwriters. Uh, I was supporting a singer called Joan Armour Trading, which was, I don't know, parents might know her. Um, and uh, I ended up getting chatting to this um, independent production company that were interviewing me for the BBC Radio 2 documentary. I was kind of like, hey, can I come in and do some work experience with you guys? And that kind of got me more involved in radio and uh, was kind of like, why I went to uni to do radio. Um, did a student radio award, uh, the selector which, I don't know, you might want to talk yeah. about a little bit more. Um, so, very, very quickly, um, The Selector is my global radio show. Um, it's made by the British Council out, outside of um, this building, um, but we're broadcast in 46 countries on FM around the world, and we run a project called SRA Selector every year, um, which, if you're at university, you should enter. Um, especially if you're involved in student radio and it's basically where we mentor six students uh, try and get them involved in the music industry and we have a winner every year and you won and I won the you second to Mexico. year yeah I won the second year and uh, the British Council sent me out to Mexico to uh, you know make radio but <laughs> we had a, we had a pretty good time to eat tacos yeah <laughs> pretty much <laughs> um so yeah i uh, i kind of won the sra selector which is a really good movement to get involved in um and from that i sent my demo um to chris bourne who was uh, the head of xfm at the time and uh fortunately he he really liked the demo uh, and got me in to do about 12 more demos until they decided to offer me a show uh, because they happened to be relaunching to become Radio X. Uh, so I, I kind of emailed at the right time. Uh, just I'd never even spoken to Chris before. I just kind of like Googled his, his email address and fired him a demo and it just came up really nicely. <laughs> so uh, that's where I am now. So you had a quite clear vision that you wanted to be a presenter and that's what you wanted yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah I, I kind of, I went to uni and I did radio production. Um, but it was kind of—I like, kind of did it just so I could, you know, one day get in front of the mic and and actually speak about music and and do what I love to do uh, rather than the behind-the-scenes work. It was a bit sneaky of me, but um, yeah, that was good. Okay, Phil. I've blagged it <laughs> <laughs> really, really badly. Um, I did work experience, which is a really, really important thing to do if you get the chance to ever do it, um, and. 
I just happened to be in. It was for XFM in Manchester, and I just happened to be in on a day when they were doing a new show, uh, and they realised they were short a pair of hands, and they were like, we can pay you a really small amount of money um, to come and help every day. And, and I did, and then I, went, I moved to London because I decided that was something I wanted to do anyway, and I wanted to work in the industry in one way or another. Um, and so I called XFM London, wildly over-exaggerated my skills and ability, <laughs> um, got some paid work here, and then when a slot opened up, um, they kind of they'd had like just music nonstop through the evening, uh, like overnight, and then they decided to open up to a presenter. So I demoed, and I got it, and it just kind of went from there really. And I went into telly, and then I came back when we just before we relaunched XFM to Radio X, um, and just from there really. But I think work experience would probably be the thing that I'd have to, to thank for my broadcast career. Just because people got to know you and they knew you as a person and you were a familiar face. And, and then you get really wicked at making tea. Like, I'm a, <laughs> if anyone wants a brew right now, I can outbrew everyone in this room. Um, yeah, but I think, you know, it's a, one of the most important things I think about if you want to get into radio particularly is that a lot of people will just see the role of a presenter because it's the final point of what comes out the speaker. There's so much that goes into a radio station and there's so many different roles. And some of them are really cool, and they're not presenting. Um, and even if presenting is the one thing that you want to do and you won't accept any second career, um, it helps you as a presenter to know how the different aspects of radio work rather than just doing a link. Yeah. It helps to know why that song's been put there and why that music's scheduled like that and why it is that we're saying what it is that we're saying. And this is a whole building of people that work towards... However, say there's four, 50 presenters in the building. There's a lot more staff than that here. Um, and there's a, the more you can learn about why that output is what it is, the better. And work experience is a brilliant platform to learn as much as you can about radio. Because once you're in a role, you're in one. Mm. Yeah. We'll touch down on that a little bit um, later as well. Uh, Jay, how is your route in? Mine's a bit of a long story. Um, I'm going to try and cut it down like dramatically. <laughs> um, basically, I started off working, doing a nine to five. I never had any radio experience or any broadcasting experience or media experience, period. Um, and I was working in a nine to five, which was in media, designing newspaper adverts. Very exciting. Um, so every day, Monday would be the same as last Monday, Tuesday the same as last Tuesday and so on. Um, until one day I decided this is boring, this isn't what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, what would be my dream job? And I decided my dream job would be to be a presenter. So I said, okay, cool, what do I need to do? I need to start by going to things like this. So this is why it's really important that each of you guys are in this room today, because I remember sitting exactly where you guys are, listening to someone like myself saying exactly the same story. Um, Again, fast forward, um, I kind of lost the job that I had. We all got made redundant. Um, so I started my own podcast. So it was me in my room um, and the microphone. My mum thinking, what is this crazy boy doing speaking to himself? <laughs> um, and literally just practice my craft because I knew that I couldn't just go out there and get straight onto a radio station. So practice makes perfect. We all hear it every day. Um, so that's what I decided to do. Again, fast forward a little bit. Um, I then had the opportunity to interview someone right here in this building, which was Lucy Ambash, who was, um, used to be on Choice FM. Um, she really liked what I did, and she was like, well, do you know what? It would be good. Like, we can try and get you in to maybe just come around, make some tea, um, help out a little bit. And I was like, perfect, fine. Um, that turned into, one day turned into like a week, a week turned into a month. Three years later, I was still here doing that. It got to a point where I actually wasn't getting paid to do it. So I became jobless. I had no job, I had no money, nothing to do. So I was struggling to travel to and from this building. Um, I had to sign on, I had to seek um, work experience and all of that stuff, I had to sign on um, at the job center and all of that business. Um, one day I was even downstairs and I couldn't afford to even buy myself a subway because I was that broke at the time. Um, but what I was doing was I had a lot of dedication. So I was getting up, you guys listen to this. So I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning to get here for five to produce the breakfast show with Kojo and uh, Max at the time. Um, I would then leave here when I eventually got a job in retail at Virgin Media. So I'd leave here at 12, get to work at one, finish work at 9 p.m., get home and do the same thing all over again. 
I literally did that for a, a year and a half until I eventually got a producer role. So that's why I'm saying it's very important what Phil was saying about, I knew that I wanted to be a presenter, but I would take anything that I could get. And I did a lot of producing on this station before I even had a chance to be behind the mic. Um, and then only maybe recently, about three to four months ago, after doing a lot of cover shows, um, doing a lot of producing and a lot of free work and work experience, I officially got my own slot, um, which I have today. So that's how I got into it. Uh, I hope that wasn't yeah as long as the five no, years kind of felt. <laughs> 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 but it shows you as well. I think people sometimes think there's that magic moment and then, oh, you're a presenter on radio and then you're, the rest of your career just magically develops and it's not. It's often huge amounts of graft and just patience, patience, pace, patience. It's not just about skill, it's about timing, it's about luck, it's about accessibility. Um, I'll give you a quick insight into my background as well. Um, I started as a music journalist when I was like 15, 16, uh, volunteering for free, just trying to interview bands, trying to review gigs. And I guess I sort of was quite good at it. I was good at spotting talent when it was gonna blow up and become something really big and exciting. Um, moved to London, did so much work experience for Everyone, record labels, radio stations. I worked for 96.4 The Eagle in Guildford. I like co produced. No, you didn't. I did. I, I love it. I, <laughs> I co produced Roy the Boy's new music show on Monday nights, which involved getting like a local band. I handed out bumper stickers for 210 FM in Reading. And I worked here. I um, helped edit their music website at Capital FM when I was 18. So that was back in like Chris Tarrant's time. I used to go and get his bagels for breakfast. It was great. Um, and yeah, just slogged and slogged and slogged. Um, I created Goldie Rocks when I was at university, started the club night, started DJing, and that built up as a brand and became really big. And um, But yeah, the key, the key thing for me was it's, you see, the key is like being a success and having maybe your own radio show, but still actually making enough money to live. Mm. And that is a really, living in London, as you know, is really expensive. It's really tough. So you can actually outwardly seem a huge success. You're on national radio, you're doing great things, but then still making enough money to live and be comfortable is, is quite a test. And it's taken me quite a long time to get to that point. And still, <coughs> um, you know, you have good years and you have bad years. I remember after university, I was touring when I was at university and I had, was doing radio when I was at university, but then when I left, that was really hard because I didn't have mum and dad paying my rent. So um, similar story to you, I would work uh, nine to five as a receptionist, um, of which I had to get up at like five in the morning to get commute into London to do. And then I would be doing secret emails about Goldie Rocks on my lunch break and running off for meetings. Hit five, I'd go have meetings, DJ, get home at two in the morning and kind of do it again. And after six months, you're just like, what am I doing with my life? Who am I? But the lucky break came and it was all all right. <laughs> it will be all right. <laughs> okay, um, what do you think makes a good presenter? Like a first. Yeah. <laughs> um, I th uh, for me, uh, I think it depends on the show, but um, I always love a presenter that can either make me laugh or really get me involved in the content or music that they are selling. Uh, so, you know, if, if they've got the latest hit, someone like Hugh Stevens on Radio 1, um, just if they've got the latest hit in a band that I've never heard of before, what it, is it about what they're saying that really gets me involved with this band before I've even heard that song. So, you know, I don't know how, how, how some presenters do it, but you can really get um, a feel for their passion in the music. And I think having a passion for music as a music presenter um, is probably what is, makes a good presenter for me. Mm. Um, well, uh, the biggest, le I, I don't know if I could say what makes a good presenter because it depends what kind of presenter you do, but the biggest lesson I've learned as a presenter and the most important thing I think most presenters learn when it snaps for you is, and it sounds really, really lame and cliched, but it's so true, is to just be yourself. Mm. And I think when you can learn how to do that behind a mic or in front of a camera, that's when an audience will really resonate with you. That's your job as a presenter really is to have a connection with people if you're interviewing someone it's asking the questions that they'd ask if they were there that they are sat there wanting to know 
if you're introducing a song, you need to give them a reason why they're going to love it and why they should keep listening to it. Um, and the best way you can do that, and I think some of the best presenters in the business are the ones that are just themselves. And if you look at some of the most successful presenters in the business, like Ant and Deck are two of the biggest presenters in the country. And all they are are just two mates having a laugh and being themselves. They're not like over delivering or anything like that or trying to be anything else. They have exactly the same conversation that they would have in their living room or kitchen on camera. And people love that. And I think that's the biggest, that's when it broke or when it snapped for me as a presenter is when you can learn to be yourself. And it's, it sounds like a really, really easy thing to do. And I think the, uh, it, it, for some people it is, but I think it, 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 I think the only way you get there is just by practice and by being, by not losing your confidence in the process. And I think that's a really, really important thing. And I think if presenting is something you want to do, then I think you should always really remember to just be yourself. I think it's a really, really important thing. On that note as well, they call it, you know, air miles in the industry. And often a lot of um, station managers will only let you on air if you've had a certain amount of air miles. And that can either be on a professional network or, a, a you know, a smaller regional network or even like student radio. But I think a key point that I'd just like to say now is that there's there's no there's no excuses anymore. Um you can be making podcasts just on your phone, like at home. You can be practicing so much. And yes, it's not the same as having a live mic and going up to the nation, but it is still honing your skill, listening back to yourself, being like, okay, this is what a link sounds like. This is how my voice is quavering. Where am I going with this link? You know, have I just lost my way? I think people sometimes think presenter is being like, hi, I'm a presenter and I'm here. And I couldn't agree more with Phil's point. That second when you're like, like I always wanted to be Zane Lowe growing up. I don't, know, I don't have the hair for it, but like um, that was that was what I wanted to be. That's the kind of presenter I wanted to be. And the you know the minute that I stopped trying to like imitate Zane's voice and how he was delivering and how he's interviewing, and he's actually, from New Zealand. <laughs> I know, but his style, you know, his vibe, his vibe. He's he's also a middle aged man with three kids. But like the second that I was just like, well, actually. I'm not as cool as Zane Lowe, so I'm just going to be myself. And it works. It works so much better. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually, is, yeah. ne is never underestimate your own cool. You all look like a very cool bunch. <laughs> um, and never underestimate your own cool. As soon as you're behind a mic, you're a point of authority that people are going to listen to. And don't underestimate your own blooming coolness. Because <laughs> that's where you start to lose confidence and you stop being yourself. Um, Jay, what do you think makes yeah, a good I presenter? I don't think there's much more to add to that, really. I think that's probably the best the best advice that you can take from that question. It is to kind of remember to be yourself. Don't over-deliver. Don't feel like a presenter is a person that can speak for ages. Because we always hear that. Oh, I, I, I'd be good at presenting. I can talk a lot. Mm. It just, just, uh, yeah. Sometimes <laughs> it's the thing where you don't, you don't want to talk a lot. Um, sometimes what makes the best presenters is knowing when to shut up and let the other person speak. Um, and I think that's very important as well. But I think, yeah, like, like the guys have all said, know, know yourself, be confident with yourself. Um, don't be afraid to make mistakes as well because there's always that sort of thought and perception that everything you say has to be pronounced so perfectly and well and you can't mess up a sentence. Don't, don't feel like that is something that you want to hear. I mean, if you're watching TV like Ant and Dec or some of the pr most successful presenters... You like to see them make a mistake. You like to see them slip up. You like to see them get their words wrong a little bit and be like, uh, just, uh, sorry. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So don't feel like it has to be so precise, has to be so, so like perfect. Um, and always listen back to yourself. Practice makes perfect. Um, don't be afraid to kind of keep on just going over things and, and trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, and knowing when to cut out things so you're not blabbering on too much because... Yeah, I think we can all be guilty of that. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think like a point that you made there, which was quite good, is that you are always getting better as well. Even like mm. the top tier presenters that you really look up to, uh, someone like Chris Moores on Radio X, he still, after every show, is getting better and better with every show. You never quite get, you know, you're, ne you're never perfect. You're yeah. never going to be perfect. I listened um, back to my show last night this morning mm. to see how I sounded to see what I can improve on tonight and to see how I can make it better. So, yeah, like the, you're never going to stop learning. And I think if you've got that sort of commitment, determination, and you really want to make it happen, then, then no one's going to stop you from doing it. Mm. 
And also that's how, you know, when you first start and you first start working in the industry, that's how you go from being like, oh, I have a radio show to being, you know, an award winning, globally recognizable figure. It is like working with good teams, like, you know, it's not just about the presenter, it's about the incredible team that you work with, as you mentioned. That, like, there's so many people that work in this building, hundreds and hundreds, and especially the production teams. We all work so closely together, and it's constant feedback, constant snoops, which is when you work with a station manager or a producer, and you go through and, and you assess your latest link, which can be terrifying, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but genuinely constructive and positive. And we're going to be doing that with a couple of you guys after the discussion. Um, I just wanted to follow your point as well, Jay, about basically just being real, mm. you know, like just be real, be yourself, be authentic as well. I think for someone that's, you know, um, presented on radio for seven years now, not on Capital, but my radio career has spanned that long. Um, I think for me as well, being real and being authentic and, and being truly myself has meant that it never gets boring. Mm. It always keeps fresh and no matter what I'm doing, even if the show is the same, it keeps it exciting for me. How do you how do you keep presenting, say, because we're all music presenters, essentially. We specialise in that. How do you keep things fresh? Uh, so I've only been doing, I've been at Radio X for a year, so everything's still like, wow. Like, every time I go into the studio, I just still get a massive buzz. So for me, like, I've not really got to the point where everything's kind of a bit... You know, I don't know if it ever gets to that point, and I hope that my career never gets to a point where I'm like, oh, this song again. But, um, you know, I'm still finding it really exciting just going into the studio, uh, you know, every weekend and doing my thing. But I don't know, Phil's been, like, Phil's been doing it a bit longer than I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think, again, it relates back to that thing of being yourself in the process. Because when you're doing that, it can never really lose its personal touch you're constantly evolving. So your approach is gonna be constantly evolving. I'm not the same presenter that I was a year and a half ago or three years ago. Um, so I think it, it just it does just relate back to that whole thing of being natural at what you're doing. Because if you're natural at what you're doing, then even if you had to introduce the same song a hundred times in a row and attempt number 79 was, oh, this is a song again. <laughs> at least that would be an authentic response yeah. you know and i think that's why it's important to just be yourself and then apply that to whatever job you're doing and then it doesn't really matter what song you're introducing i'm pretty much in the same boat um i've i've worked what feels like the longest time to get into that studio and be able to call it my own show so i'm just enjoying every single second of it at the moment so hopefully it never gets to that point but yeah, and on Capital Extra, there's always going to be something that Drake's done that I can talk about. So there's <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to get boring, is it? <laughs> try, uh, try, try, try Oasis in the reunion <laughs> every single day. <laughs> okay, so let's um, make it specific to you guys. What do you think makes a good demo? How do you grab that person's attention? I think, I think personally, like one of the. One of the, the funniest things that I heard from Chris when he listened to my demo um, was that he doesn't normally listen to demos that aren't tailored to the station. Uh, so I was kind of naive to this and sent in uh, my student radio uh, demo, which is kind of what you hear most of the time, you know, take all the best bits from your show, put it into a nice two and a half, three minute little package and send it to... Um, send it to the station you want to work for. My advice would be do that but send it to some people that you know in the industry that you really respect and that you know you would trust their feedback and take their feedback on board and then use that to make another demo to the station that you really want to work for. Like for me, I always wanted to work for XFM um, and I should have taken that demo and then repackaged it with the music that they play here at Radio X. Uh, but. I sent in my selected demo uh, from Student Radio. And fortunately, you know, Chris still listened to it. He still really loved it. So it still worked, but- um, But that is quite rare. I would, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so rare. And he was, he was like, you know, I'm really grateful I listened to the demo because I don't normally do that. Um, so my advice would be tailor it to the station that you want to work for and really listen to the station 
that you want to work for, whether it's Capital or whether it's Radio X. Listen to that and listen to the presenter, see what they're doing, try and not copy what they're doing, but listen to the little turn of phrases that they have and try and make it your own and just send in that three minutes that you're really happy with, that you've got feedback from people you respect and send that into, just Google whoever's email address, who's in charge of managing director of the station and just send I'd, it in. I'd add to that as well, with demos, you've got to remember that quite often you, you'll only get one go at this, take your time over your demo. If you're like, mm, yeah, mm, I changed that, but oh, that'll do, it won't do. Like only send it in when you think it is as perfect as it can be. And that might take a while because you might, might need to practice more. Um, you might need to edit it or re-record the demo, that's fine, but just take your time because in likelihood they'll listen to it once. If they like it, you'll get called in to do another one in-house. And if not, if it comes around in six months, they're probably not going to listen to it. So just, yeah, bide your time with that. I also think there's, sorry. You're all right. <laughs> I, I also think there's this kind of old cliche that you get taught, you know, keep banging at the door, keep sending those emails. I think what the best thing that you could do is probably send one really, I, I think chatty emails work. Like I think, be concise. Don't be like, you know, I just came back from, Bali and this is what I got up oh. to. I've just come back from Bali <laughs> and he is just rubbing it. <laughs> She's up found my herself. Nose. She's I found, found myself, herself, guys. Um, like. But yeah, you know, be be chatty, but be concise uh, and don't send an email every week. Uh, they are busy, but they will still see that email and they will recognise your name. If if you're sending a, the same demo every week, then they're going to be like, oh, gee, him again. Honestly. Free now. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Only two. Uh, right. The thing to remember about a demo is. It's just an opportunity for somebody to hear what you sound like. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't ha you don't have to make your own station IDs <laughs> or anything like that. It wants to be about three minutes long. You want to listen to the station that you're demoing for to get a feel for what it is the presenters are talking about. Are they just talking about music? Are they talking about content from the day, etc.? Three minutes long, Max. Try and get a nice little variety of links in there, as in maybe do one that throws to something on that station website, one that's just a very, very short, it's called a crunch and roll, so you talk off the back of a song and then over the intro of a song, show that you can be short in your tone and delivery. Maybe a read for the breakfast show. Um, and try to have a nice little variety of different types of links in there. One standard music cell is a really, really great thing. Show passion for music. There's no radio station in the land that does not love passion for music. Um, and that's it. Just keep it keep it nice and short. Do everything you need to do in three minutes. Get in, get out, send it off. And put your good stuff at the beginning. Like put your really good stuff, like the first, I think the first two links should be like excellent. They grab your attention. I was a judge for the Student Radio Awards this year, which is tomorrow night. Um, and honestly, like the, the three minute show reel, but if you haven't really grabbed me after the 50 seconds, I probably am not gonna listen to the rest of it. I'm probably gonna have made my mind up in that moment. <coughs> and I feel that's kind of how it is now as well. Like if, you, if you're if you sending in a demo and the first two links aren't that great, then they're not gonna listen to the rest of it, whether you've made it three minutes or one minute long. So I think your aim is to kind of just make sure that those first two links, because what I was always told was that people never ever listen to the whole demo. They only ever listen to the first sort of minute, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, and then they'll know. So don't feel like, you know, oh, I have to make this such a long demo. Or, and that doesn't mean you talk for like a minute. <laughs> it means that you do like your best maybe 30 seconds and then you're out, literally. I would say don't put the whole track in the demo as well because then you're losing time. That's a very important thing to, to mention. Because I think my first demo, I literally, it was about 10, 15 minutes long because I'd speak, <laughs> then I'd play the whole song. So it was like a mini radio show that I was sent <laughs> They to know what the song sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to kind of just get maybe the first five seconds of the song and then if you're talking off the back of the song, then obviously the end of the song. Um, but also to just add to all of that, I think we're in a different time now and I think there was always a cliche of the whole, you know, if you don't have a demo and if you don't send it to you know, uh, a producer and they don't recognize you that way, then you can't be a radio presenter. Mm. I think those days are kind of gone now. And I think um, some, of the some of the examples that you've heard on the panel were very rare cases. Um, but what I would probably want to know if I was sitting where you are is how do we do that? How do I do that if everyone else is sending a demo? How, do how does my demo become important? And I think once you kind of try to 
again, it's going back to that whole finding yourself thing. Once you've found yourself as a presenter and you're doing everything you can across something that we have now that wasn't in the past called social media, mm -hmm. then people are naturally going to kind of notice you before you've even sent the demo. So if you've got your own YouTube channel, you're doing things on Instagram, you're tweeting, do you know what I mean? You've got your own Facebook page, you've created a podcast, you've got a website which can be made on like Tumblr or Squarespace. You don't need to pay people for that now. Um, then you send a demo, including all of those links and say, hey, I'd really love to kind of maybe come in, see how a radio station works. Here's what I sound like, but here's all the things that I'm doing. Yeah. That's gonna make me notice you a lot more. I wish I'd made that point. That's a really, <laughs> that is a really good point. Thanks, mate. Other, st <laughs> other stuff. Um, but yeah, and I think that would be the most, for me, that's the most important thing because yeah, it is, uh, we're in a completely different time now from like where, I don't know, people used to stand outside radio stations with CDs or bombard producers with presenters. Create your own brand and then the rest will, will fly. And then I guess, uh, you know, how do you create your own brand? Well, again, I think it's just going back to using all the assets and the instruments that are around us now because, like, it's something that we're probably all still building here. Um, I'm still building my social media, um, my Instagram, my Twitter, at JLondon, follow me. <coughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and I think it's building your brand and building your website and building your passion as well as, do you know what I mean, not taking the slot that you've got on the radio station for granted mm -hmm. because we know nothing lasts forever. One of you guys are probably going to take our jobs one day. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that obviously we've got our own brand so we can we can fall back on that as well as that and that we're showing a passion for the things that we're talking about on the radio as well as being on the station. When it comes to social media and brand identity and personal brand, um, how I think there's a fine line maybe between being a sort of jack of all trades and master of none and how well do you think it complements doing lots of other things that still relate to brand Radio X, for example, DJing, TV presenting, writing in magazines, that kind of thing? Um, I think it's, I think it's good, you know, it's good to get involved in, in stuff outside of Radio X because, you know, um, you can be, I'm not, I'm not saying that Radio X are going to just drop me tomorrow, but you can be as loyal as anything to a brand and one day that might all be gone. It's kind of morbid, but, you know, one day they might just decide that someone else might come along and take your job. Um, so it's good. It's great to get involved with as much stuff as you can outside, but I would say be picky as well. You know, don't, don't undersell yourself. Don't, don't, you know, when you obviously when you're starting off, you you, you know you've got to get experience. But once you get to a point, you kind of have to look at yourself and be like, look, I'm I'm going to do that because that fits in with what I I feel fits my brand. But you know, don't don't just do everything. Be picky. I would say. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to do a little jig. Is it a little lean? As if no. you had something really profound. Well, no, to all say. I was going to say was take every single opportunity you can get, which is an exact. <laughs> opposite of what you're saying. I'm not saying like go and you know, if someone says hey, it's twenty quid, go kick those kittens. <laughs> Say yes to that. <laughs> right has that been a genuine? <laughs> has that been a genuine <laughs> offer? <laughs> it was a dark time. Um, but I think in terms of broadcasting, any experience you can get is a good thing. And I think sometimes, you know, there is a certain snobbery to some jobs and some other jobs and some of the naffest jobs I've had have provided some of the best experience. Like some people are really, I haven't actually done this, but some people are really, really snobby about, you know, that like, um, like challenge TV kind of like late night quiz stuff. And some people are really, really snobby about that. However, I now know, and without naming them, probably about five broadcasters who've worked on jobs that I would kill for, like Extra Factor and stuff like that, that started out doing stuff like that. Mm. Because for example, it's a great studio floor format show where you're live with an earpiece. And that's experience that they could have at the time been really snobby about. They were doing stuff like MTV or whatever. Um, but they weren't snobby about it. And that's experience that they'll carry with them then for the rest of their career. And I don't, I don't think do like absolutely everything if it's questionable. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do, think that the, I do think that any experience you can get is a good thing. But just make sure that the jobs that you're doing, whatever they are, you're doing a really, really good job at. Like at Radio X, they're happy for us to do other stuff, but they want, quite rightly so, they, you know, and that, 
because this is you know my bread and butter is my main job they want radio x to be the main top end priority mm -hmm. so that's the kind of agreement i guess you make with your main job is that you go okay well if other stuff comes up i'll take it but this is still my main job I'll add to that as well, when you're still trying to get your foot in your door and you're still trying to build up a CV and a repertoire, um, and it's quite, <laughs> repertoire, and it's quite rare to get like a really big job, as I said, until you've done those air miles, and that can be TV miles or on radio miles. Um, but if you're clever with how you market yourself online, and that's either yourself at this stage or working with the publicist later, you can do the sort of like naff, slightly cheesier jobs, like maybe the challenge TV stuff, no diss to challenge TV, but um, as long as online people get exactly what you're about. So you're not the challenge TV girl or guy, you're like the indie person that's in gigs every single week and is sussing out this new band. And that's what people will see, whereas that you're actually getting the practical experience as well. So I think if you manage that well, you can be quite clever with it. Yeah, just to kind of go back on my point, I mean, when I was saying be picky, I didn't mean uh, in terms of like when you're trying to get into the industry. I mean, take every opportunity that's thrown at you when you're trying to get into the industry. But in terms of brand management, as you know, you, you get more into your career, I would say you can you can then you, you're allowed to be picky at that point. I think the phrase is work, work smart, not hard. Um, instead of working like really hard, work really smart. But on the flip side, you need to work really hard. No one's going to be able to to get to a point that they can say they are a presenter without working hard. And I think that's something that's often forgotten. Um, it's really nice and easy to see how, you know, presenters and musicians and your Drakes and Beyonce's are like where they are and be like, oh, that, well, yeah, well, I kind of saw them a little bit when we was growing up, but they kind of came from nowhere. They're so successful. They've worked hard. Mm -hmm. They haven't just got there. Um, never feel like anything's owed to you as well because I was I was working on the station for so long and I was getting so frustrated that I wasn't getting a chance to do what I had to do but who's gonna who's gonna make that opportunity only myself so until I've shown them that I have got the dedication and the passion and the commitment to do exactly what it is that I know I can do they're not gonna put me in that position um, so yeah never never come in with like a, a <laughs> miserable attitude or you know if you've got an opportunity, then know that that opportunity is one that someone else would die for mm. and someone else would really, really want to, to kind of get that. And yeah, like the guys have said, try and do as much as you can. Um, if you can get to a stage where you are selective, then then by all means do that and never do anything that would kind of like detriment your own brand. Mm. So if you're building yourself up as like a platform, don't do anything where you kind of feel, oh, do you know what, will this, is this a good thing for me or is it not a bad thing for me? But do as much as you can until you get to a point that you can actually be selective. I'd actually just add to Joe's point as well, and we're gonna have to be so, oh, we've got two minutes before you have to dash off, Phil, because Phil's actually on air in 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna add to Joe's point and then we'll, we'll let you go and then we'll open it up for Q and A's. Is that all right, darling? Yeah. Um, that, it's yes you do have to work hard and we all work hard and you have to work hard consistently you can't just get the job and be like great I've got it now let's roll around and champagne and bubbles um but it's also about I think a lot of it's endurance like endurance and patience that you're like well why hasn't this happened yet why hasn't this happened yet and then that's the bit that gets so frustrating you're like oh they still haven't given me the show I'm covering all the time or I'm stuck on a slot I wouldn't like or why aren't things going further and if you just hack it out and are patient and keep going, often that's when the magic breakthrough moment happens. Um, okay, do you want, I think you might have to go, love. What time is it? Oh, it is 44. Oh, <laughs> um, well, listen, best of luck to all of you. Sorry, I have to go. Um, best of luck to all of you in your future careers and stuff. And do you know what I will say? Um, there are people all up and down the country that want to be presenters. And I'd say the fact that you guys are committed enough to be coming to stuff like this is a great, early step to show your dedication and potential within the industry and your future careers. Give them hell in the Q&A. Um, <laughs> I'll see you later. Okay, cool. So on that note, I think we've got about 15 minutes-ish. Yeah. Um, so we'll open up for Q&As. And if not, then I've got two cue cards full of questions that we can carry on talking about. Does anyone have a burning question? Yes, at the back. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, cheers, mate. Yeah. <laughs> so stop the crackle, innit? I d you never know how good quality these mics are. <laughs> but they're always excellent quality at Global. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for me, it had to be, um, what happened was I was covering early breakfast. Uh, so when you're on, you know, weekends, overnights like me, you get the chance to kind of show yourself and, uh, have a little bit of airtime across the schedule. Um, unfortunately they asked me to do, uh, the early breakfast for a week, which is warming up for Mr. Chris Moyles. Um, now Chris likes to have half an hour of the studio to himself before his show starts. So I have to switch at 6 a.m. to a studio that I've never used before. Um, and you have to like change the transmitter and there's a newsreader waiting for you at the bottom of the, um, at the bottom of this other studio. So you, I kind of got down there and was like, oh, I have no idea how to use this studio. Uh, sorry, dude. So the news was an absolute shambles. Coming out of the news, um, I played uh, a band called Walking on Cars and I was like, oh, I'm just so, I'm so happy I got that, that song away. I'm so happy I got that song away. And then I was just like, I don't know why, but I pressed stop and then I pressed eject on the song. So it stopped playing and then I reloaded it. Um, bear in mind, I knew Chris Moyles was listening and, <laughs> and he kind of, um, he came in on the uh, talk back and was just like, nice one there, Ross. And I was just like, <laughs> Oh my God. So um, yeah, kind of, uh, I, I must've been doing, I must've been at Radio X for five months at that point. And um, I did, it was one of the most nerve wracking things in my life. And I got the next half hour out of the way. Chris Moore started his show. Started the show uh, with the same song from Walking on Cars. Stopped it and then started it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, we all make mistakes and off the back of that, I got to hang out on the Chris Moore show. They, they, they invited me in and, and completely just rinsed me for, for half an hour on the show, which was, it, it was amazing. So, you know, sometimes mistakes turn into, uh, into good things. Um, for me, it's probably something I learned a little bit later when I was speaking to people is to allow the other person to speak. Mm. And I think that's one of the most important things. If I'm sitting here speaking to Rihanna, you don't want to hear me. You want to hear what Rihanna's got to say, right? So there's always that, that danger of being like, oh, I need to sound really cool and stuff because I'm speaking to such a big celebrity. And it's, it's not about you. And I think you kind of need to remember that um, when you're interviewing people because it's it's about the person that you're speaking to um for me i've always been a person that whether i'm on screen or on radio or interviewing someone i try not to do the whole cliche thing so i want people that i speak to to remember that they actually spoke to me i don't want to ask them you know when's the next single out mm. how did where did the inspiration come from um how was it filming the music video mm -hmm. do you know what i mean i want to know like what's your most embarrassing moment like, what did you have for breakfast this morning and why do you eat that? Mm. <laughs> like, when's the last time your mum told you off? Like, I want to know things that is just just a little bit more out there because if you, if I want to find out or if you want to find out when their next single is, you can just go and Google and find out when that is. Um, so for me, that would be my advice to interviewing is to, again, it goes back to that point of being yourself and having a chat with one of your mates. And, and once you can make that person feel comfortable to have a chat with you, then they're the best interviews. Mm. One of the best, one of the best uh, tips that I learned at Folded Wing, uh, which is the company that makes um, uh, the selector, which uh, Sam works on, um, is that sometimes you know the longest questions are the worst questions. Like uh, your question right there was it was perfect. You know, what's your best interview skill? Like that's that's short and it's to the point, and that's kind of like what you need to get away. Like I know what, how to answer that question. Um, you know, if you were like. When you're doing an interview um, and you're speaking to the other person and then he's like talking to you, so I'm like, um, what was what, what's the question? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, be concise when you're interviewing people. Yeah, I'd agree, listening, 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 and also giving people room and space to answer. Um, I think with radio, you're very hyper aware of dead air and like quiet, but actually, especially if it's pre-record, let people relax into it. If you can have a bit of banter before you start recording as well, that person's instantly going to engage with you and be connected with you and probably give you a shred of information that they they wouldn't before. I remember I was interviewing um, 
this band, which I'll remain anonymous. Um, but we just started talking about if a ship got hit by thunder and lightning in the sea, would the fish underneath the ship die? And they thought Sounds this was riveting. the most, hell- <laughs> it, it was so exciting. Um, but they just loved me. And like the interview literally lasted like twice as long as it should have done. We got all this exclusive content. It's like, that's how you're going to sneak stuff out of people. In the same way that like, if you're gossiping with someone or you're chatting someone up in the pub, it's that, it's the same engagement technique. It's getting people to warm to you and trust you. That thing you, you said about dead air, one of the kings of uh, kind of dead air um, in real life is Louis Theroux. Like you see in his documentaries, he asks, he asks, he'll ask a question mm. or, or there'll be like an awkward moment in the silence and he will win every single time. He'll just be standing there saying nothing and eventually the other person will crack. Like, yeah. th- I, I love think, that. Yeah, for me, Louis Theroux is probably my favorite presenter um, in terms of documentaries and things like that. There's a variation across all different things. Um, but yeah, like you said, I think it's just, again, it's that technique of allowing someone to speak and he gets the best responses from people. So good. Because they'll just start crying. Like he'll speak, he'll speak <laughs> to someone and he'll just... With one look. Yeah, yeah one <laughs> look. And they'll just start crying because he's allowed them time to actually think about what they're about to say and put themselves in that situation rather than, you know, interrupt and be like, so on to the next thing. Or putting words in their mouth. Yeah, then, exactly. yeah. I met him the other day and I, I nearly cried. <laughs> yeah, I love to lose him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. <laughs> Should we go first? Um, I think a turning point for me was going to the hairdressers. Uh, <laughs> like when I was coming in to do my demos, I had this like horrible fringe, and it, it was the worst thing. And I kind of, the day before we had our photo shoots for the new Radio X, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go and get that that chop sorted out yeah so yeah. <laughs> um i think for me it was kind of accepting the jobs that were presented to me because i was in this building for a very long time doing a lot of producing and i became arguably a good producer um and because i was good at what i was doing Everyone around the building thought that I worked here. They thought that I was a producer for the station and they would always call me up to do producer jobs, Mm -hmm. which was great because I'd be getting paid for it now and it was all really good. But then I kind of had to make a decision. Is this what I really enjoy doing and is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? Um, And it was only a little bit kind of later into that that they called me in in for a producer role that I sat down and I said no, even though... I liked doing the producing, but I would produce and I would cover, and I would produce and I would cover. Then I would produce, 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 and then do a little cover. So I I needed to make that choice of what do I want to do and how do I want to present, and am I going to be happy producing for the rest of my life? The answer for me was no at the time. You guys might get an experience doing producing and find out you really love it because it is really cool. Um, But I think for me then, yeah, I think you need to be true to yourself as well when you can get to a stage to be true to yourself and decide, do you know what? I'm going to go for this and this is what I'm going to do and I'm not taking anything else like for an answer. I think for me, it's (coughs) it was doing those things that you sort of looked at from afar. I mean, you've already taken the step because you're here, you're in the building. So you've had like the the common sense and passion and ambition to go, oh, what is the big music project? Wow, this is open, I'm gonna apply, I'm gonna come. But it was, yeah, I remember I heard on Capital, they were like, we're looking for interns on, on air. And I was just like, uh-uh. I'm not gonna get, I'm not, uh, I'm like, oh, oh. and I was just like, just do it, just do it, just do it. And then I came in for an interview and I had to inter- interview for the unpaid work experience slot. And I got it. And I, you know, I did the same with the BBC at certain points. I did the same with for magazines. And it's kind of like, but just thinking there's no chance in hell they're going to consider me for this. Well, they're going to consider someone. It could be you. And just um, if you don't get one thing, not thinking, oh, well, I might get the other. Just, yeah, just keep going and have a go. What's your unique selling point? 
Like what, what is, why is someone at Global going to give you a job more than anyone else? And every, every presenter, every person in the public eye, no matter what you're doing, whether you're a chef, whether you're a music presenter, whether you're a DJ, you've got it. That's your, that's your thing. You've got to find what it is that makes you completely unique. And that might be what you're talking about, the style of how you present, um, your personality, uh, the, the construction of a link, the kind of music you're playing. I mean, how accessible you are. There's a, there's a thousands of things that influence that, but it's, yeah, getting it in an elevator pitch, I think is a really good way of having that clear in your mind when you're creating your brand identity. And an elevator pitch is basically, if you were... Uh, if you got caught in an elevator by coincidence um, with Ashley, who is the big, big, big boss, and you're like, this is who I am. This is what I'm all about. This is what I want. And like having that in literally the, from the time that it will take to get to the ground floor to the sixth floor, you can say that. And he can be like, oh, that girl in the lift, she was cool. She was cool. Yeah. <laughs> I would say also like when uh, before, you know, you get that first show or whatever, don't don't worry too much about trying different types of things like my, my social media must have been such a mess before uh, I got my first show because you don't get that projection until, you know, you do get that first show. So, you know, try things out like and, and have, have, have fun with it as well. Don't don't worry too much before you get that first show because you will kind of suddenly fall into place. Things will fall into place uh, when you, you kind of get that projection in the first job, I think. One of the one of the things that really grinds my gears is social media numbers. And I think we live in a time now where if you haven't got 10,000 followers, you're not successful or you're not cool. And it, it literally plays on everybody's mind. You guys in the audience, us on the panel, everyone around the world. So I think sometimes we can feel a little bit shy to put things out that we actually feel, do you know what, I want to put that out, but oh, will it get like will it get likes? Mm -hmm. Or, oh my God, only 10 people's liked it. Oh, it's not that great. Once you've once you've got past that, then I think you will do so much better. Um, and it's a shame because we never had that before. So it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing because social media does help. Um, but I feel like if you want to stand out for the crowd, just be yourself and put yourself in front of everyone. Try not to get too caught up with how many likes that post is getting or how many followers you've got. And always be conscious of the right person seeing it rather than everybody seeing it. Mm. I think we've probably got time for the last question. One more, one more, one more. Final question. Maybe no. Oh, yes. How would you, what is your top tip for someone who wants to make like, the conversion from a role in a radio station to, say, like, presenting? Like, what would be the top tip? Uh, <laughs> 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 what? <laughs> I kind of, yeah, well, I think because I kind of did that, um, I think it's a little bit about going back to that example that I said about knowing what it is you want to do. Um, never feeling like something's owed, owed to you though because you can you can come across ungrateful for the position that you've already got and I think that's very important as well you don't want to kind of go in there like oh, I'm not producing your show anymore because I want to present that's not going to get you anywhere I think you need to be very careful and maybe just a little bit cunning with how you how you're you're, you're wiggling your way around the building and that might be that might be speaking to the right people or Literally, I would be producing, but then the next day I'd go into the studio and just record a demo mm. based on the same advice that I've probably given the presenters because it's me giving them that advice. I can do that. Mm. So let me just let me just do it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So I'm ready for, oh, hey, guys. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you have a listen to this? Just um, I've got maybe I've got an idea for the show. And do you know what I mean? So I think there's ways around it and to do it. Obviously, not everyone's a producer. Sometimes you might be on reception or but I think it's looking for those opportunities if you're already in the building and you're halfway there. Um, so it's just trying to speak to the right people. And people are open and people are needed suddenly. And, mm. and you know, this does happen. The transition between um, working at different things, becoming a presenter, it does happen a lot. But I think at the same time, yeah, you've got to be careful that you're in the building for a reason and they need you to fulfill that role. And if you're the annoying one that's constantly being like, oh, oh, and it's like, oh, God's sake, well, do you know what? We actually just really need you to be a good producer or we actually really need you to be yeah. like a good intern because that role. But you're, if you're the best intern, if you know what people need before they even need it, if you're super friendly, if you're always on time, or always professional, always putting your hand up to volunteer, then you're just generally a likable professional person, which helps full stop. I mean, 
when I got my first work experience slot here, I remember my one of my jobs was then interviewing for the next work experience slot. And if they like, if they say they want to be a presenter, don't invite them in because they're just going to be the annoying one that's constantly like, I want to do a demo. It's like, just come in, do the job you're supposed to do, do it really well, and then negotiate when you've got people's trust and yeah, you proved yourself. And I think the hardest thing is, is to get into that building. It's not an easy thing. And I think, again, it just goes back to building that brand and then trying to grip onto any opportunity that you see that that can get you into the building. Luckily for me, I was creating a really bad podcast at home, but hell if anyone finds that now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it gave me the opportunity to reach out to people and just try my luck. Do you know what I mean? Oh, Lucy Ambash, breakfast show. Uh, can I just interview you? I just, I just really want to interview you. Luckily, she said yes, and I don't know, maybe if she said no, I wouldn't be sitting here today, but I think opportunities will always come around, and it's just, as I say, if you're in the building already, then you're halfway there. I, uh, I always try and catch, sorry, <laughs> I, always, I always try to catch people in the pub, um, like, they, I feel like people are a bit looser, like Radio X drinks or something, if I want to do something on the station, I'll probably like, no, everyone's going for a drink after work and just like slide along and be like, oh yeah, well, yeah, I wanted to do that thing. Like, how about it? And they're like, probably just be like, oh yeah, well, you know, that, that, that could work. And then in the next meeting, when it's a bit more formal, you could be like, remember that time in the pub you said that? <laughs> that's, that's working. <laughs> So that's all we've got time for today. Um, if you've got any more questions burning into your mind, you're like, oh, I wish I'd asked that. Oh, it's gone. Um, but you can tweet us direct. I'm at Goldie Rocks. I'm at Rossi. Um, at, at Jay London. Or you can uh, tweet us at The Mothership, which is at Big Music UK. In fact, it'd be really nice if you tweeted loads of really nice things about us. That would be great. Uh, use the hash, hashtag Big Music Project. Big masterclass. Mention how amazing her Sam's tan is from Bali as well. <laughs> <laughs> she really found herself, didn't she? <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your enthusiasm and good luck.